Okay, Premier Romeo, we're waiting for the others to rejoin. Again, apologies to our viewers. We were having some technical difficulties and we lost the Facebook feed. So we basically had to restart the stream very quickly. So we should be back up on all of our channels now. So we do apologize for that interruption. And the, the conversation was just getting very good. I lost some of my comments, so I'm gonna have to figure out how to bring them back in because there were a few of them that I highlighted um, in terms of the perception. Because for one of the things that I realized from the last uh, discussion we had, which was probably the second show as it relates to decolonization and starting this education process that you guys alluded to that has been going on for a very long time. And for me personally, I am in my 40s. I basically lived all my life in the Virgin Islands, apart from the times I was away to college. And it's something that we've never truly spoken about as a society and a community to understand. First off, as, as a friend of mine told me, we have to first understand what colonization meant to us as a people. Yes, yes. And how destructive it was and how much it set us back from a national development standpoint. So when I shared the link for tonight's show, you know, I, I posed the question and I said, you know, do you understand how self-governance is connected to national development? Tune in for more. Okay. Because that is really, for me, I think after we get finished with the basics of what the decolonization is about, even more fundamentally what, um, what colonization did and what it is we need to be on the path towards in terms of, of self-governance. So Chris, I don't know what question they were answering, but- um, um, we, there, there was a discussion about spiritualness. Okay. Uh, I just I just want to add this in, right? Mm -hmm. That- um, Are we live yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That yes, we have to, we are spiritual people. Um, the problem is that our over, over reliance on spiritual help to some extent has been to our detriment because how many times during during enslavement where we were like oh well you know the good lord gonna set us free one day and until we took matters into our own hands we weren't free or to some extent free absolutely free. absolutely so but chris chris I, that's I, because chris that's because god helps those who help themselves you stole my punchline, Doctor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 as as um, Miss Smith Archer said, an important part of of making progress on this matter is educating our people, politicians, and people. I'm being educated. I'm just beginning to learn fully um, what um, decolonization means and how important it is for us. How we can help our country in particular. But so we need to be clear. It doesn't mean automatically that we will achieve independence. It means that we will require all the resources, the infrastructure we need to full, be fully sustaining and self-governing. It would mean working to get to the point where automatically we are economically stable, socially stable, politically stable, capable of mature self-government and able to maintain a political our political and public service affairs in a democratic and lawful manner with low corruption, little risk of loss of freedom internally and externally, that is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite a challenge. And I think we focus too much on the end result, which is independence generally, or on whether we become fully part of Britain or become an associated state, which are the three choices. We need to focus on that process of development that gets us to the point where we can stand on our own, own two feet economically, socially, politically, and otherwise. That's what we need to focus on. And uh, whether your country is doing well or not, whether you're dependent on Britain like we are, we need to um, educate our people. And then we determine what exactly do we want? Mm -hmm. How will we achieve but, it? Premier Romeo, let me ask you this. Suppose the UK changes the rules. Suppose the UK came in and said today, no, we don't like the idea of self-governing. We, we are going to come in and put people in your, in your legislation, in your legislature, whatever, 
if, then they have the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. So, so what would happen if they did that? Who gave them that authority? They took it, the same authority they used to colonize you. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with you because okay. right. they don't like the idea of decolonization. They don't want us to be decolonized right now. They don't right. cooperate with you well, why is that? right now. They don't. Why? Why, why is that? Because, <laughs> why is that? Yeah. I think they value us more than we value our own territories. They understand the value we have. And mm -hmm. they're hoping somehow, somewhere down the line, that they can dominate the situation. And um, we will become um, more connected with them where they can take advantage of our resources and, and what we have. But that was and, the that, that's my beginning. concern. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's my main concern because it's something where a, a friend of mine, um, you know, again in the conversation we were having, because it, it really made me pause when we stopped to think about colonization. We learn about slavery in schools because that's what they taught us, basically. Um, but apart from that, from a national development standpoint, that is absent from the curriculum in terms of as um Dr. Brown alluded to, there's a natural cycle in uh, nature for maturity you understand and from the time i read in our constitutional order in the virgin islands because we don't have a constitution because we're not sovereign that anytime her majesty's interest that's right. is in conflict with virgin islands interests that's right. her majesty's interest will, will triumph of so course. for me there can never be a situation where you are truly looking out for my best interest because when my best interest conflicts your interests then we are going to have a problem. And that for me has been why, you know, the, 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 the conversation around decolonization has been so quieted over the, the last three decades on the ground. I mean, we, you know, I'm learning our governments have been going to the C24 meetings at United Nations every year. And people are speaking on our behalf without any conversations with us as a people. You know, some of the comments I'm seeing is, oh, this is not the wish of the people. How has this been assessed? Because it is unfair for, for leadership to go and speak on behalf of the people they represent without uh, um, a real conversation, I would say. Not speaking to me in a speech about something that, again, I have no knowledge about from an intelligent perspective to make an informed decision to say, well, you know, let's, let's go towards integration. Yes, we want to have more rights as a citizen. We want representation in the UK Parliament. But again, if you're going to make a move to make a motion in the UK Parliament that let's put a representative in there on behalf of the OTs without a conversation with the OTs, I have an issue with that. <laughs> you know, I have, a friend, I have a friend who says that if you use the master's tools, you have to follow the master's rules. And, and so you do have to be careful when you're building the infrastructure that has been, been talked about. You do have to be careful. I've already given the example of what happened in Bermuda, you know, and, and I don't think that our people need to have college degrees to understand our predicament. I never signed on to that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Braun, quick question. You have, you have vast knowledge of the region. What happened in... 2009-2010 period. We know what happened in Bermuda. Can you educate some of us on what happened in Turks and Caicos Island? Well, a lot of things happened in Turks and Caicos. Uh, the British government made a decision to suspend the Turks and Caicos Islands uh, constitution, so to speak, and came in and essentially took the country over. And almost, I think it's, it's almost... Uh, uh, $200 million or so later, the, there is still a trial ongoing of, uh, of former government ministers, the former premier. And uh, there's no evidence that all of this was necessary. If they thought that there was some uh, criminal or corrupt activity, surely they, they could have done something about it. But mm -hmm. to suspend the Constitution, that's what I mean by how much authority they have. They can do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And that is what has happened in Turks and Caicos. And Turks is now trying to rebound from that. And of course, they are very fortunate in that they have a very successful uh, tourism product. And they're doing well with it. Um, I don't know what the Brits are going to do when they see 
having, you know, if they see that kind of success, chances are they will want to be a part of it in some way. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it all boils down to, uh, yes, can we make our own decisions? Are we adults or are we children? Uh, and, and the issue was touched upon earlier about corruption. You know, listen, I can find you co examples of corruption in London every day of the week. So corruption is not something that is unique to uh, 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 former colonies that are now independent. And I don't think that that's fair. You know, when you talk about corruption, it's widespread. Mm. Well, what, what I would say, Premier Romeo, what I would say to your, to your points earlier, which, which are valid points, the, the problem is that the people setting the rules continue to change the goalposts. Mm -hmm. So if they say, well, you have to check this box, this box, this box, I guarantee you, once you check those boxes, they're going to add four more boxes for us to check. And in our minds, we're going to say, well, as long as somebody from England says it, it must be correct. Let's look, let's look at England over the last 10 years. They've had three to four different prime ministers. Theresa May, David Cameron, now Boris Johnson. Each one of them lost their prime ministership, one's on his way out, um, through disgrace. One through Brexit, Brexit one through um, internal strife, right? And our, I would submit that if we look in the overseas territories, we have not had that level of strife in our islands as compared to Britain, but yet we are looked at as we have to meet their girls, but they don't look, they don't meet our girls. I was in London for um, JMC meetings. And all they could point to that they're done for the overseas territories, well, we gave you free vaccines. Okay, what about this? What about that? What about the other? Well, we gave you free vaccines, right? They spent, they have, they have wrote off, right? The government of England has wrote off $4 billion in fraud through PPEs that are, are unaccounted for. They have given us nothing as overseas territories. We have to be on here suffering financially through COVID, and they have given us nothing. So um, I, I agree with your your points, but I I have to cut it off somewhere along the line. Like, <laughs> may I ask you a question? Who in the uh -huh. world knows how we are treated? Who knows how we are treated? You are treated when we went to the JMC, um, when you had the hurricane and you didn't get help. Who knows? What forum have we used to put the pressure on the British government to do what's right by us? When have we united as overseas territories leaders uh, to speak with the same voice? When have we gone to Britain to use their tools to tell their people about how our rights are being denied? In have 2000, we our... I'll answer, I can answer part of that question. In 2009, the premiers of Cayman, Bermuda, Turks and Caicos, and BVI were all in sync in 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 uh, in in London in talking about what the British government had and had not done to assist the territories. Did you what mean we the got prime in minister? return? What we got in return was investigations of the premiers of Cayman, Bermuda, and Turks and Caicos. But tell you what my experience was in 2017 when the hurricane struck and hit Bob. Um, BVI, Antigua, Anguilla, and a few other territories. The Premier of Cayman, thanks to him, called a meeting in Miami where six of us got together. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, I said to everyone, it's time when we go to Britain, we meet the Prime Minister. No FCO minister. We meet the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. We drafted a letter and insisted that they treat us um, in relation to their responsibilities to us under UN law under UN Article 73, it was written into the letter. We stated our case as to what we needed, and we had a meeting with the Prime Minister. And before we even spoke, she clearly stated to us, 10 of us sitting around the table with her, that she was going to address each of the three concerns we had. And she gave very positive um, responses. First, she said she was going to give 400 million pounds, I think, uh, to BVI and Anguilla. At that time, they didn't explain how it would be dispersed, but she mm. answered to it. 
They spoke about helping Cayman with their financial matters, the challenges they had internationally. And then, because we were coming out of the EU, they promised that would, they would assure us that whatever monies we would lose from EU arrangements, that they would cover them. Now, because we went to the prime minister, we didn't go to anybody else. Surely she would not have wanted us coming out of her office, going to the media to speak um, negatively. We have to begin to operate in that manner. We are leaders. We need to take our case to the leader in Britain. We mm -hmm. need to speak to the media about what's wrong. But what I've learned is that what influences the British most is when we speak in the UN General Assembly or when we speak to the UN Committee, when what we say, what we put on record mm -hmm. is made into a resolution, it's shared with the entire United Nations. I remember, and I can speak frankly, no premier now, I can speak frankly to the people. I remember when I spoke to the General Assembly for my first time in support of Antigua and the other territories that were affected, I described the Montserrat situation. And then I made an appeal to the United Nations Please do not do to Antigua and these other territories what was done to Montserrat for 20 odd years. When I got to Britain, little did I realize that the minister I had difficulty influencing was keen to speak to me. In fact, I got great results after mm -hmm. that time. And I realized I went to the UN once and someone in the UN pulled me aside, explained how I should make my presentation and explained how I would have best effect and I followed his guidance. And let me tell you, the results were dramatic. What I can say is that in leaving office, I'm, I've been hoping that the government in power would take advantage of what was set during that last year. The mm -hmm. UN committee came and visited Montserrat. They did a resolution which showed that the people of Montserrat were all united about the issues that concerned them, but there needs to be a follow-up we have to use, we may not be able to go into the House of Commons and speak, but we should be able at the United Nations to expose um, what's wrong. And may I say lastly, the UN Committee has on members who are very, very, very favorable towards us, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And that is why the British government does not want to work with the UN Committee, in my view. It has Russia on it, it has Cuba on it, it has territories in the Caribbean who are supportive of us on it. And you could go on and on. Mm -hmm. When we use that forum and the, the fourth committee as well, the British government are concerned about what's exposed there to the, to the entire world. We and and how, had they, how had they expressed that concern, Premier? How have they expressed that concern? What do you mean? Yeah, the Brits, after they heard the presentations and you said they were concerned, what did they do? Well, not as much as I would like, but I began to see some changes. In fact, I can say that the ministers responsible for providing aid put together a package of not as much as I wanted, but certainly addressing the key areas that we were most concerned about. We're now going to have a 15 million pound hospital um, built. It's all agreed on. The government of Montserrat has improved on the, uh, the project for the port. They're getting an, another 13.4 million pounds. And we got the fiber optic cable put in place. These are things that we've been waiting on for 20 odd years. So I am very confident that working through the UN has had some impact. Mm -hmm. But what is important is that mm -hmm. our whole country understands that our you whole mentioned, parliament is united. You what mentioned that the, that the Brits, whole, that the UK did not like the, the idea of the, of the committee. Well, you mentioned yeah. What? Why? What is it that they're opposed to? They know that's a forum that can be very effective in influencing them and exposing to the world what is happening to their territories. They're aware well, of that. What are they doing to the territories that they don't want people to know? Well, for instance, Montserrat. For the past twenty-five years, they've spent nearly six hundred million pounds on little Montserrat with 5,000 people. And guess how dependent we are on them in those 25 years? We're still 60% dependent on the British government, no change. They have known that had they spent the money on the key infrastructure we needed, we would be less dependent. And they have delayed providing that. So they don't want you to so, be less dependent? They don't. 
Right. Okay. But we need to find a forum to fight for that. And then I'm going to tell you this. When I was part of the group of territories, of course, um, some of the other territories are much better off than Montserrat. But we mm -hmm. found ourselves isolated when we're negotiating. And that is why that event in 2017 was significant. When we united uh, on behalf of BVI and Anguilla, we were not affected much. They had better results. Mm -hmm. So we need to unite. And we need to use the UN forum. We need to go to Britain, not when they ask us to come. We need to arrange a meeting and prepare ourselves to make our case to them and to the general public. And we have Black, British, Monstrations and from all the territories who are voters in England. They have members of parliament who are Labour representatives, Conservative representatives, and Liberal representatives. If we found a way to use them to lobby for us and expose mm -hmm. our situation, they're able to influence their members of parliament who represent them. We have not really used all of these um, opportunities that can be used. I, I agree with that. Premier Romeo, we definitely do need to be more assertive on a consistent basis. Um, we have a question, though, I think it's in the same vein, Chris, in terms of what we've been talking about. Um, someone's asking, one, which concrete steps do you believe the Caribbean OT should take to ensure there will be no need for a fifth decade of the, or of, yeah, that's supposed to be, fifth decade of the eradication of colonization? So I think Premier Romeo, you did touch on some in terms of um, stability. Um, and, and these are things, whether we do before or after we change the status of our, our political relationship with the UK are going to be needed. But what I, I guess what people want to start to conceptualize is, you know, what, what would be those steps? So are we going to the UN next year as a bloc? to say to them, you know, we need you guys to come in on the ground, do a thorough assessment of what, what people's understanding is of decolonization in the first instance. And Correct. then from there, give us the technical resources. I think I'm answering the question. But this, <laughs> this would be what I would say. Give us the technical resources that would come in you now and help with that process. Because the fear I have is currently we have announced a constitutional commission to, to start the process of talking about constitutional review. And, you know, there are, again, persons that are pro um, self-governance. There are those that are saying we're not ready yet. And then there are those that are pro-British, I would say. Um, you know, one of the comments I just saw was that th this panel is anti-British. And that's far from the case. I would say that this panel is pro-Caribbean um, people. And when I look around the region, and look at the potential that we have, um, regardless of size, because size for me has nothing to do with it. You know, when, when countries like Singapore and, and Thailand were first starting out, South Korea, you know, they were looked down upon because they were also colonies at one point of, of the superpowers of the day. But those people, as Bob Marley put it, a hungry belly will motivate you. <laughs> and they had, <laughs> they had to pick it up and make make it happen for themselves and here they are you know 50 years later able to say they're you know in 20 which means they're one of the top 20 economies in the world and and those types of blocks that's all they measure in terms of their progress but i don't see where the the caribbean is any less that's that's the, the i think the false mindset that we have to break through we are no less than the North American or the European countries or even our, our brothers and sisters in Africa. Because at some point, we have to decide that we have to, I should say, get to a place to understand this colonial yoke that we are under is not going to be taken off of us. It is something we are going to have to put a plan in place to throw off and, and forge our own destinies, you know? Come, come hell or high water, as our, our elders would say. But anyway, back to you guys and the question. That would have been- may, may, I, may I refer to you as Shana? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, that is so absolutely true. You know, uh, one of the, the, the damaging things that has been done to us in the process of colonization is that our confidence has been eroded, our confidence in ourselves. So we start thinking that we're too small 
too vulnerable, as one of the uh, one of your listeners uh, indicated. No, no, size is not important in in this argument. So I'm happy to hear you say that. I did see a message from Toby Butterfield from Bermuda. She raised a, 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 a what I consider to be a delicate political point, and that was rather than calling for independence, which traditionally invites all sorts of uh, 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 you know polarization and opposition. She said that we should maybe say that we are preparing for independence. Well, that's a political judgment and a public relations exercise, but I thought it was very interesting. Well, mm -hmm. what, what do I suggest? Let us first put aside our differences, our debate as to whether we want to be fully part of Britain, whether we want to be independent, or whether we want to be an associated state. Let's put that aside. Let's all argue for sovereignty. Let's all argue for good governance. Let's all argue for education of our people about the whole issue. Let us ask the UN to place an office in each of our territories that will assist us with the education process, which assist us with putting together a plan for us to be decolonized individually in whatever form we wish. If we want to be independent, associated statehood, or whatever we decide in the end. But first, educate our people what this whole decolonization process is about. Once that is done, I think um, you'll find that our differences will disappear. And each territory will recognize the importance of, of the whole decolonization process. The other thing we need to do is to have our leaders um, find a way to decide on how we're going to support each other with whatever we do. Whatever Monstrat's ambitions are, collectively we give the support to each territory. Whatever our cons whether we have a disaster, whether we want to be decolonized, whether we want um, to form a new constitution, whatever it is, let us support each other. Let us galvanize our people in the diaspora in the UK and even those in America as well to support us in making our case known to the British public, the British taxpayers and the world. And above all, let us commit to rightness. Let us as a nation decide, let's do things right. Because I learned one thing at the beginning of my term. I know the British government loves to um, accuse us of corruption and the works. Sometimes there is, sometimes they're not. But I decided, let me put procurement right. Let me put pro project management right. Let me put financial management right. Let me agree to, to good governance. So they have no excuse when I stand before them and demand what is right. Those well, are I, I happen to agree with you on the point that we should do as much as we can uh, to make ourselves more efficient. But I'm not interested in making ourselves uh, 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 approvable, approvable, if you want, for lack of a better word, by the British. Who are they? Who are they to set the standards? And on what grounds do they establish that? Well, I'm not saying to let them. I want it. us to be right because it is right. I want us to be Correct. educated because it is right. I want us to be efficient. Correct in the civil service and the provision of goods and services because it is right, not because Correct. we're going to get a good grade from the Brits. I'm not giving well, them my, my whether, work to, to assess. Whether we're independent or not, it is best for us to put our affairs right. I agree with you. But you cannot stand before uh, the British government if you are not standing on solid ground. So we're doing it for our own good, not just because we want something from Britain, but it's right. good for us as a nation. Yeah, it's good for if us as, as human beings. Yes, exactly. It's exactly. good for us as human beings to do things right Absolutely. and for the right reasons. But I, I, yeah. I, I don't like the idea that because there may be someone in a government in Montserrat or Bermuda or Jamaica or somewhere else or in the BVI that, that has done something illegal or corrupt, that therefore the whole country 
is painted mm -hmm. and suffers because of it. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous because if I was to do that on the reverse and, and we could do it uh, with the UK, we, that's a full-time job. Yeah. Yeah, if, if let me, let's, let's use a contemporary issue. The world, for some people in the world right now, are on edge because of what's going on in Ukraine. In Ukraine and, and Russia. Mm -hmm. And on this side of the world, the argument is like, oh my God, Putin is about to recolonize uh, Ukraine. He's going to use force and take their land, take, their, take over their government. And we must do everything. We must have sanctions. We must send um, military over there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the moral equivalent of how people are reacting to the potential recolonization of Ukraine. They don't have that sympathy for us who are still colonized, right? We would we were brought her by force. We will work in the fields of Montserrat, BVI, Cayman Island, Jamaica, you name it. By force. We are still being dictated to by force. But people don't have that sympathy for us to say, oh my God, look what's happening in, the, in those overseas territories, right? In 2018, they had an order in council to say that they are going to force us That's right. to um, open our books. The beneficial owner registry. Right? Mm -hmm. They're yeah. going to force us to accept same-sex marriage. Yes. They are going to force us to allow British people to come here and vote in our elections and run in our elections. They didn't get too far off this, the latter three. Their focus initially was on the, on the books. Now, yeah. if you, and, and along the way, we have been, each one of our islands have been blacklisted, right? Continuously. But the biggest country that has money laundering is, is, is London. But they are never blacklisted. They are never on the blacklist. How's that? They do the list, Chris. That's why. That's right. There you go. <laughs> my, 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 my point to you, my point to you, Honorable Romeo, is this. We have to do what's right because it's right. But no matter how much right we do, the British will always end the world. Correct. Because the allies, right, will always look at us as less than. We are not equals. Let's, let's understand that. We, are, we know we're equals, but we are never going to be viewed at, as equals, mm -hmm. right? And until we stand up, as you said, Honorable Mons, um, Romeo, until we stand up together, tell our own stories, mm -hmm. that's when people respect you. People yeah. may not like you, but when you stand up, they're going to respect you. And, that, and that's one of the reasons we have this show. It's not mm -hmm. just because we want to talk on the video or whatever. Mm -hmm. We have to unite, right? And if we don't unite, they're going to say, see, the Donders probably don't own themselves. Let's just pick them off one by one. Let's go after um, Honorable Foy this year. And after that, we'll go back after Honor Honorable Brown. <laughs> then we go after um, someone else. That That's that we know the game plan. So I, I, I know we have to wind up in a few, but what I would say to all of you, the listening audience is that we have to unite. If we don't unite, they're not gonna respect us. They're, not, they're never gonna like us. They're never gonna see us as equals, but they're gonna damn well respect us when we stand up on our own two feet. But so, I, like what, I like what Premier Romeo said about the coming together. There's, there's no harm. And there is strength sometimes in coming together as political leadership and making a point. Mm -hmm. And I think that when they, the, the, uh, the, 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 the premiers met in was 2017 in, in Miami, yeah. was it 2017? Uh, that yes, then right. they were able to take a message to them. If that kind of communication stayed up at a, at a high intensity, right. it, would, it could make a difference. It could make a difference, but, but I think the battle has to be to fought say, on different um, levels. Honest, the story. Premier Romeo, I'm not sure if you're not connected. Are we still connected? Now yeah. we are, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, am I connected? Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Go ahead. I think you have a delay, but we can hear you and we can see you. Oh, I think his, his, audio, his audio dropped out. Dr. Super Brown. Yes. Could you, for those who don't know, could you tell us the audio that you're going through because of the stance you've taken? Well, I, I can go through some of it. Of course, the, you know, there are legal situations which are uh, mm -hmm. not for public disclosure. Well, just, you know, condense it down to... Yeah, I can just it. say that as a result of the things that I did in 2009 w concerning the Uyghurs who came in to, to Bermuda from Guantanamo Bay, uh, the governor at the time, Governor Gosney, Richard Gosney, in, started an investigation based upon the words of a convicted criminal uh, that he figured that I had done something corrupt. That investigation spanned more than 10 years at a cost of more than $10 million. And at the end of that this, uh, investigation, they were unable to point to any single instance of my having received funds or anything else uh, personally. And so what they did was they decided that they had to have charges because they had spent $10 million. And so the charges consisted of uh, a contract that I had as a physician in the community with the Leahy Clinic in, in Massachusetts, a contract that was 21 years old. They referred to that contract as being a bribe. And our point was, well, it had been a bribe for 21 years. You didn't say anything about it. So it's just a matter of convenience. Then the other half of the um, charges mm -hmm. came from uh, the, the contention that I raised money for the Progressive Labor Party. And some of the people who made donations also received government contracts. Uh, just outrageous. You know, yes, some of them did and most of them didn't. And so what? What's new in the fact that contributors sometimes uh, uh, receive government contracts? There's nothing automatically corrupt about that. In fact, we learned how to award contracts from the previous governments in Bermuda. So we understand. And the process is, is we're fighting it. It's extremely expensive. But we think we have a great legal team uh, consisting of, of uh, a, a, lot, a number of Caribbean uh, uh, lawyers. And uh, we think that we're going to be victorious. It's just that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a matter of it's time consuming and there's a certain amount of stress involved. But over the years now, we have become used to that. Uh, thank you. Our, our, our prayers and support is with you. We're going to go to uh, our final media um, chat and then we will go, come back to you, Honorable Romeo, and then wind on. So again, we want to thank you. We apologize for our technical error earlier. And we want to thank our media partners around the Caribbean, Zaya JB in Montserrat, PJFE in Sabre, CBN Radio in the Virgin Islands, Cayman Marwood in Cayman Islands, Channel 82 here in Bermuda, and as of next month, Radio Turks and Caicos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all those that have tuned in via YouTube. We want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel because once you subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel, you will always have notifications of our next show. And also, we in between shows, we put up news briefs and other informative items. So, uh, Prima Romeo, over to you to... Do you have any closing submissions? Well, I, I'm happy to have been afforded the opportunity to speak in this forum. At first, I felt I was speaking to myself when I looked at the screen and couldn't see you, and I was rambling on. But I really enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed um, my conversation with the Honorable former Premier on the phone the other day, and he has begun to influence my thinking. And um, because he has, a, he has that way, of, he has that way on people. <laughs> yes, I, I we've begun to forget um, that right to fight for sovereignty because we are in granting aid. It's it's a survival thing. It's trying to get past, you know, the next stage. 
But what I can say is from this meeting is that we should not be discouraged. Goliath came out and taunted Israel. And for 40 days, is it 40 days? And the soldiers on Israel's side were afraid. You know, sometimes those we fight against are more afraid of what we can do than we realize. And sometimes it takes just a stone in the hands of somebody who is confident that God is on their side. And I'm repeating what I said at the start. If God has given us a right, Like it's frozen. Yeah, I think we lost him again. Dr. Braun, any closing? Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Prima Romeo. Yes, um, I, I don't know where you lost me. Where was he said I? if God has given us the right. Yes, he will empower us to achieve what we set out to achieve. Let us commit to rightness. And let us join together and look at the examples of the past. Nothing is achieved overnight that is mm -hmm. important. Do not be discouraged by the orders or the bullying that we may face. But be confident that once we have a right, it's God-given. And God will give us the strength, the wisdom, and make a way economically, politically, socially, as far as our education goes or healthcare goes, you name it, he will make a way for a nation that's committed to doing what's right and fights for its rights. Thank you. Any closing remarks, Dr. Brown? Ever so briefly, just to thank you all for tolerating me uh, for, for this uh, during this program. I really enjoyed the conversation. I learned things, which is something I like to do. Uh, I would like to say to all of our people, who are interested in this topic, that um, God does help those who help themselves. Correct. And we have got to help ourselves. And the last point I'd like to make is that our people don't need a lot of education about self-determination. Mm -hmm. If you need a college degree to understand our predicament, something's wrong with your understanding because most of our people don't have college degrees mm -hmm. and yet they feel the pain of colonization. So I would say to, to all of you, you know, to just keep on keeping on and uh, we will get there one day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And before, before we close, I just want to personally thank Dr. Brown because in Bermuda, we are a passive people, right? We have leaders that have been happy to become, get in a position of leadership and just stay below the radar just to, you know, buy the time. Now, I don't mean just political leaders. I mean business leaders, social club leaders, so on and so forth. Dr. Brown, any Bermudian will tell you those that like him and those that don't like him is that he didn't just conform to the status quo. He shook Bermudians up and says no we are not going to be passive anymore. And during his premiership um, was the first time in my entire life that I saw a thousand white people come out and protest because they felt that here's this black man who is, they did, he, it's nothing wrong that he did that harmed the country, but oh, he insulted the queen. He didn't ask the queen's permission through the governor to do this. What have we learned about Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay since that? That they were torturing people, mm -hmm. right? The CIA was torturing people. Obama closed that down. President Obama closed that down. And he asked for help from Dr. Brown. What have we learned about the Uyghurs since that? That in, in China, the Chinese are oppressing their own people, the Uyghurs. So I say all that to say it's, it's a host of things that Dr. Brown has done, but the most important thing that has done is inspired my generation not to be passive. And 
one of the things that uh, I personally can attest to is that um, he was one of the first politicians in Bermuda to be on Facebook. And I used to send him a lot of stuff through Facebook saying, hey, why you don't come talk to us and why? And he used to say, you need to get involved. Get involved. I'm not here to talk to you. I'm, you're here to get involved. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I am involved in politics is because of Dr. Brown. So thank you, Dr. Brown, from my generation to yours. Thank you. You are Shana? Well, I, I think um, our audience tonight have had several takeaways. For those that are on the radio that can't see our panel, I mean, we really had a very informative conversation, which is what we had promised um, when we were promoting this, that we do need to learn more and hear different perspectives from across the different sister Caribbeans. Because sometimes we just hear things in the news and assume you know, we fill in the gaps to the rest of the story. So I echo the sentiments of the closing remarks, definitely feel that we do need to be more united and assert our position to that right to be self-governing. Because, you know, there are so many case studies when we look across the world of countries that are smaller and bigger than us that have done it successfully in terms of self-governing. They're not perfect. And that's one of the things I want to caution us about because sometimes we're saying we have to wait till we're fully developed. But what exactly does that look like? Mm -hmm. Because then we will be in a holding pattern until, you know, two, three generations later saying that we are waiting. So I think it's very important, as I believe um, Premier Romeo mentioned, you have a plan in terms of your national development strategy saying that you're striving towards a goal. And at that end state, for me, that's where I feel the Virgin Islands should go. That if we are in the process now of putting together a national sustainable development plan, that at the end of that 20 years, we should be in a position to make a decision. If not then, or even before, because we, we have it as a goal. And if you don't have, because if you don't set this as a goal, we will be constantly having these conversations from one generation to the next. And you know, Chris, when I saw the panel discussion from our previous guest in Bermuda, where a 92-year-old got up and said he wants to know when, when, what are we doing? You know, in his lifetime, what he has seen, I guess, has been lost to those of us who didn't live through the, the, the oppression, as some people would tell me. But again, we have to, we really have to understand what colonization is first. I, I, I firmly believe that now more than ever. And when we do, we'll appreciate why we need to set self-governance as a goal in order to fully develop. Because to me, then, that is the trigger where we call our own shots, as it were. Not for the sake of calling your own shots, but only you can look out for your own best interests. Am I right, Chris, or am I right? <laughs> well, um, just, 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 just as full disclosure to the premiers, um, this young lady is my cousin. Yes, okay. He sold, <laughs> he sold me out. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just trying to help you out. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of our, our our missions of this show is to educate our people on on a host of items. So our in March, our first episode in March will be about Caribbean economics and blacklisting. And it will be coming from a Caribbean economist and advisor Marla, Marla Ducaran. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But she has some, uh, we'll be putting our links on our Facebook page of some interesting videos that she's done citing the, for lack of a better term, the racist component of blacklisting. Mm -hmm. And she'll be joined by Joanne Moxham of the Cayman Islands. In at the end of March, we'll be having an episode on climate resilience because as, as we have all been affected by hurricanes one way or the other, climate resilience and environmental protection. One of our guests will be the Honorable Deputy Premier of Bermuda, Walter Raban, who has done a lot of work in environmental protection. And we're hoping to get a minister from a few other islands. So we'll keep you all abreast. But these are our upcoming episodes thus far. So again, thank you once again to our partners. Thank you to our listening audience, our viewing audience, those who are watching us online, watching us live. 
And thank you most of all to the Honorable Premiers for taking the time to educate the people of the overseas territory. Thank you very much. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. And we will be right back here again. Again, save the date, March 9th. That it will be another very informative and interesting conversation as we continue to unite our overseas family. Good night, everyone. Good night. All the way.